Welcome back to another episode of our podcast, Is Breakfast Included? How y'all doing? This week on the show, Bernie and I are joined by the incredibly talented Peter Holmstrom. Peter is best known for his thoughtful guitar work with the Dandy Warhols. And this week, he sits down with us to discuss his musical journey, the evolution of his sound, and the idea of having just the right amount of success. We also get into Peter's creative process and what keeps him inspired outside of the band. Stay tuned for an exclusive behind-the-scenes chat starting right now. So, all right, man. Tell everyone who you are. Hi, I am Peter Holmstrom from the Dandy Warhols. Um, play guitar and do a bunch of bass and synth and percussion and whatever else is necessary. Um, yeah. Right on, man. Where are you right now? Um, Portland, Oregon. Portland, is it cold there? It's getting there, yes. Yeah, yeah. It's nice. It's not raining at the moment, but... <laughs> so, uh, hey, when did you start playing guitar? Let's start there. My dad brought home a guitar when I was probably probably in kindergarten or first grade. Um, and he taught me a couple things. Um, but it didn't really connect until... Um, probably about high school or something <clears throat> when when I you know just got into music more um, I had taken some lessons here and there but didn't really didn't really pick it up like uh, wasn't really inspired by it until like high school right on no. uh, around what year was that high school yeah uh, that's Early eighties, eighty, what is it, eighty two, eighty three, somewhere in there. I don't know, I don't know. So, you, uh, was this in Portland as well? Yeah, um, my my family moved here in the mid seventies. Right on. So, early eighties, mid eighties. That that was all that glam era. Yeah, I I was more into, um, you know, new wave, uh, and I guess. I don't know, dark wave or whatever you want to call it, but like more, more goth kind of stuff. Right on. What kind of bands were you into? What's what any bands in particular that, that really got you going, man? Well, there's, there's always a, there's a progression. There's always one main band that I'm obsessing on. And then there's sort of little, the ones that kind of, uh, like kind of around it, I suppose. Um, Duran Duran was a huge one for, for a number of years. And that led me to um, Japan, and then I obsessed on Japan for a long time. Um, and then I think it was like my first first time out at like a dance club. I heard uh, Ministries every day should be Halloween or every day is Halloween. Right on. And I asked somebody what it was, and they told me it was Love and Rockets. <laughs> and... So I went and bought everything I could find, you know, trying to find that one song for years. Um, became obsessed with Love and Rockets, Bauhaus, Tones on Tail, that kind of thing. Um, and only found out much later that it was ministry. Um, but yeah, um, those guys, Echo and the Bunnymen. Um, yeah. Right. When did you, uh, when did you meet Courtney? Uh, the first times we, first time we crossed paths would have been, uh, Adam, this music summer, summer music camp thing. Mm -hmm. Um, he was a percussion player, a uh, drummer, and I was a saxophone player, um, in this band, like, uh, like big band kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, orchestra. Uh, and he was just like the coolest kid. Um, he wouldn't have, he didn't have anything to do with me. Um, cause I was not a cool kid. Um, but then, then like a couple of years later, his band played my high school, like some, some semi-formal dance or thing, whatever it was. Um, and that's when we started like being in, in sort of contact. 
and he he put me he had um he put me in a band with a bunch of kids that were a little younger than him that were about my age so that was my first band um we like we like to think of it as portland's first goth band yeah whether that's true or not i don't know but <laughs> possibly and uh, when when did like when did the idea come on to start the Dandy Warhols with him? Um, after I finished college, actually, um, he came out and stayed um, stayed with me in New York, and um, uh, he had a I don't know, just like he was he was doing cool stuff, and it just I felt like it was time to move back to Portland. Um, and by the time I got back to Portland, he'd been kicked out of the band he was in and he showed me some songs that he was writing and I just asked him to teach them to me. It just kind of went from there. And that, that was it, right? Uh, that was the spark. Yeah. Yeah. He had some great little ideas. Um, and yeah. Yeah. Right out of the gate, I guess you guys were, uh, I mean, pretty hot right out of the gate. I mean, you, you were your sound was a, a little psychedelic, a little druggy, you know? Um, mm-hmm. Is that something you guys planned, or was it by accident? Um, I mean, it's all sort of planned. There's... Um, the, the main thing was, was just that none of us really knew what we were doing. Like, Courtney had never played in a band... Uh, sorry, never played guitar and sang in a band. I had never, well, I'd played guitar in a band, um, but we'd played like three shows, so yeah. that barely counts. Um, Zia had never been in a band before. She just wanted to be in a band. And, you know, it was, so it was, it was keep it very, very simple. So the very simple songs, three, three four chords max, if, there, if it has to have a chorus or a, a different chord change, then, then okay, we go there. But most of the time, it's just those two, three, four chords over and over again. And all of us just playing the same thing with just different tones. And then vocal harmonies on top of that. And that just ended up being the sound um, that made us stand out. Um, and just using effects to sort of make it sound more, <laughs> more interesting. I don't know, more, more developed, like more, more stuff's going on. Yeah. Uh, but it was just like, you know, playing with the, the fact that we didn't really know what we were doing. Yeah. And so it, 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 in a lot of ways, it was kind of a first for everyone. Like yeah. it might not have been your first band, but it was kind of like a first band for everyone seeing how Courtney was, playing guitar and singing for the first time you had been in a band but you know really it was kind of a first for you guys oh absolutely yeah and did the did the chemistry just happen right all of a sudden yeah i mean the, the, oh, you're gonna be doing this you know all these years later no clue <laughs> i mean back then it's like doing anything more than five years you know was seemed impossible um that seemed like forever Um, and I don't know, it just, it all happened really naturally and that we, everybody was excited. Nobody had anything better to do. So like we rehearsed three times a week and Courtney and I lived together. So it was like a constant, uh, I don't know, creative creativity happening all the time. Right on, man. Um, you, uh, you're you every, everything everything i see of you 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 you're you're playing an sg is that like your guitar of choice that's your weapon of choice that was for 20 years yeah yeah um that just i had um before i moved back to portland i had i had gone to a guitar shop and and bought that because i wanted to play music again mm-hmm. um, and it was just a cheap guitar um yeah, it became my main instrument for 20 years. And then after 20 years, I've, I've kind of just got scared taking it out. Is it, it The headstock had been broken twice. It's like all sorts of things that happened to it. Um, but 
it turned out that it was more just it was more interesting to just play other guitars. <laughs> How do you decide what guitar to use for a song? And do you have a favorite guitar that you use? Um, I have some favorites at the moment. I, I mean, there's always there's always a few that stand out. The SG is one of them. I have a a, a seventy two Tele Deluxe that, or a Tele, sorry, a Tele Thin Line um, that that was another kind of main guitar and then lately it's um i've been playing these guitars that my friend saul cole made me um just it was just that kind of time um to find my own thing i guess and he had just come up with a, a body shape and design that i that i really liked Nobody else. I mean, he sold a few before me, but nobody else was really playing them. Out oh. now, they're my thing. Cool. But yeah, that's been the last five years, and I've got I've got three of them now. Um, probably a twelve string and a bass six version, hopefully on the way at some point. <laughs> Very cool. Do you like that? Do you like just being the guy that's you know having something that really no one else is playing? Um. No, I mean, it, that's not, it wasn't, it wasn't ever that important, but it's like, I'm always, I've always been looking for my thing. Um, uh, I mean, I, you stumble on it no matter what, yeah. but, um, guitar wise, it just sort of ended up that, that way. Um, you know, it, I saw Saul's design. I tweaked a little bit and sort of ended up combining like three of my favorite guitars to, without really knowing what I was doing. <laughs> do you have one right now that you could show us? I do. Yeah, everything's from, from tour. Oh, wow. Yeah, man. That's, that's, that's kind of cool. Yeah. Kind of a, kind of a Talman shape. Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah. Yeah. Not, uh, not quite, but you know, that, that top horn kind of like a yeah. Talman. Mm-hmm. Got a, I don't know, like a jag body. It's kind of got that offset thing, um, which I I was using a, a um uh my jazz master in the studio, like the most kind of tone wise. Um so that that was definitely part of it. And I and I like the trim on these a lot. Um right on, man. Yeah. Oh, cool. Well, we'll quit. We'll quit getting all gear heady. I could sit here and talk about gear all day. I could see, I could see her, or Lisa's frustration. <laughs> I'm choking. Uh, anyway, so l- let's get back to the dandies, man. You guys, you guys, you guys. Like I said, you you recorded the first album. The second album was for Capital, correct? Yeah. Yeah. And then, I, and that was the one with, um, uh. Not if you were the last junkie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, that was the the breakthrough. And as we were doing a little research on you, you know, we 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 saw that um you that Nick Rhodes produced one of your albums. Yeah, um, that he produced um Welcome to the Monkey House. How how was it working with Nick? Unfortunately, I never actually was in the same room with them. Um, it was one of those things where um. We had been recording for, I don't know, eight months and kind of needed some direction. And um, Courtney and Brent flew out to London and did some extra vocals and uh, a little extra production. But mostly it was it was Nick adding so many keyboards to to the record that it, it felt like he deserved more than keyboard player synthesizer player it was uh-huh. you know it, he definitely did so much that he deserved the the producer credit was that cool for you since you had been a fan of uh, brand? yes it was and i like still pissed off that i didn't get to go <laughs> and, um, but did you eventually get to meet him i did yeah um a couple times um uh yeah, I guess we were, yeah, when we were in London a couple times, um, 
he took us out um to to his his club i don't know a club that he belongs to i you know that that very english thing where you're a member yeah. <laughs> um yeah i it's just so you i think it started just so you could drink all night or whatever <laughs> You know, not not be restricted by the ten a ten p.m. clothing time. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's very cool. Um, how has your approach to songwriting like evolved over the years? Do you feel like it has? Do you think? Oh, you know? ab- absolutely. Uh, I I feel like I can maybe finally call myself a songwriter. Um, um, in the beginning, it was just I'd if I came up with some chord changes that sounded cool, and Courtney thought they were interesting enough and wanted to write some lyrics for them. Um, and once like Pro Tools came along, um, I that's something I got into really quick. I, I got to see it in action when we were doing 13 tales. And then later on we were at massive attack studio for, to do it, uh, to try and do some music with them. Um, and I saw their, their guy, uh, Neil, like just, just was a master with it. And it seemed very, very interesting. So, um, yeah, I got a, an early pro tools rig. And because of that, I've, I've sort of learned how to use that as a, a songwriting tool, um, just moving things around and experimenting. Um, and yeah, now it's, now I like, I actually challenge myself with trying to, trying to do more than I did the last time. So, you know, I don't know. It's always something new that's inspiring. That's like, I'm trying, that I want to, do my version of or uh-huh. something. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just to get back to what you, we were talking earlier, you said that back when the, back when the dandies got together, you know, like there was a, sometimes a five year lifespan on a band. You guys have been together quite some years and it seems like newer bands, they get together and before they even have their first album, they're planning their side project. <laughs> uh, yeah. What what keeps a band like the Warhols, man, just, you know, how do you keep it fresh? How do you keep getting along? How do you, you know, keep from killing each other? Well, you have side projects. We do all have, we do all have side projects except for Courtney. But I mean, I guess his side project project is the wine bar. (laughs) But, um, I, you know, in the beginning, it was just, that nobody else nobody had side projects you just had your thing that everybody just had a you was in a band you know sometimes drummers would be in multiple bands because there was always a shortage of good drummers but besides that you know you just you stuck with it and i guess we had enough success to, to to keep us together maybe not too much success so we didn't get too full of ourselves and think we could go on our own but um and then just over time, we just learned to ignore the the nonsense and and just kind of everybody's has their bad day and let them have their bad day and kind of try not to take it too seriously. Um, Is that what leads to side projects in your case? Like, you know, like, ah, I got some shit I want to do. I don't want to deal with them. So I'm going to do this. I well with with the dandies the, in the beginning there was if if Courtney wasn't interested in what whatever idea you brought in then it didn't get done mm-hmm. and so I had all these things floating around that he wasn't interested in um, and that's what ended up being my first my first record um, you know and it was essentially that's how I learned pro tools too it was was doing that record <clears throat> um so one of your side projects i see that you're in like tons tons of side projects actually but your main one is the p international airport 
Um, and how does that let yourself, how, how do you, um, how does it let yourself, how do you, I'm so sorry. How <laughs> does it let you express yourself differently than with the Dandy Warhols? Um, it's generally like I get to do everything or, you know, I'm, I have the, you know, the final say on everything. Um, so that's cool. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's like, if I'm, if I want to, you know, get, I don't know. I, it's just sort of following every song, like to the, to where it's supposed to go. I, I don't ever feel like I know what it's supposed to be, but with like, with the dandies, it's like I'm not allowed to, nobody really is allowed to like fully go in, like take over a thing over the song because everybody gets to put their two cents in. And so it's allowed me to, to, to learn, you know, chord structure and, and, you know, creating melodies in a different way um, where I don't have to worry about somebody else like poo pooing it. <laughs> you know, it's like, I guess it, I get, the only person that can do that is me. So, yeah. and yeah, I mean, I do it all the time, but. And how, how do you guys, you Courtney, say, how do you, how do you keep the dynamic, the band dynamic fresh after all these years? Like you guys just finished the U S tour. How do you go on the road after all these years and still not, you know, be at each other's throats? Or are you at each other's throats? <laughs> no, we're we're not. We're not. I mean, it, it, you know, as I said, we so people have bad days and you know don't get enough sleep, don't get enough food, whatever it is. Um, but I don't know. It's like most of the time we just we we figured out how to get along, and going on tour is something that's. I don't know. It's fun. We don't, we don't overdo it with like too many dates in a row. You know, um, we try and keep it easy in that respect. Um, and I don't know, just, we've got the, the right amount of comfort, um, versus work. So that's, that, that just tends to be relatively easy. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you this. Uh, I, I am, I was, uh, a big fan of the movie dig. Okay. And, um, I mean, even rewatching it, it just, you always kept, you always see something new in there that you didn't see the, you know, the, the time to watch it last. One thing though, in there is you guys' relationship with the Brian Jonestown massacre. Do you guys still have that weird love hate? relationship so that's the sort of thing about that movie that was kind of i guess not completely faked but exaggerated uh -huh. um, because there's so much uh, there was never really uh the love hate thing we always just loved them we thought they were great um maybe there was a little bit of jealousy on their side because we got signed sooner um i don't know um but you know we were we were always hanging out we kind of always saw those guys um there's well, in the, the movie maker has footage of, of anton yeah. singing at my wedding <laughs> did not put it in the film yeah and in the so, film you see you see the the camaraderie before be, between the two bands like there's that that support system between the two bands. But yeah, I think he focused more on the, uh, the trying to capture the, I guess you could say the jealousy for lack of a better term. It's, you know, the filmmaker made a great film. It's just not really accurate. It's not, it shouldn't be called a documentary. But Did you guys, do you like the movie? Um, I, Yes and no. It's it's a weird thing because like there's there's things that are edited in a different way than the way they actually happened, and 
kind of it just kind of messes with your memories in a weird way so i i made a decision to not watch it again just because i want to try and remember my version of it of yeah the event. that's fair that's fair there there is that iconic scene at the viper room where the the brian jones hell mask or get into a brawl which uh it, it kind of recently replayed in australia yeah. yeah what did you think of that when you saw it it's it's just sad it, i'm you know i don't know i don't know the details i haven't really talked to anybody in the band about what happened but um i know that anton hasn't been sober for a while and i'm sure that plays into it um it's unfortunate because they're such a great band. They're amazing. Yeah. And just I I still love all the records. Like, yeah. The weird experimental electronic stuff. It's great. Yeah. Uh you guys released Summer of Hate uh back in October. Is there mm-hmm. is there a full album you're gonna release anytime soon? There is a full album. Um, and it should be coming out in March everything goes right all right how was the uh this this tour you did in the u.s did you play a lot of new material on there just summer of hate um part of the problem is having a drummer that lives in melbourne australia so rehearsals are we don't rehearse as much as we really need to um and it's easy to run over, you know, run through all the old songs like a couple of times, make sure you still remember the tap dance routine and all that. Yeah. But new songs take a little bit longer and we were trying to get a couple more in, but it just, they just didn't, they weren't ready yet. So, but in March we're going out again. So we you'll be in Australia, yeah. correct? Um, uh, uh, Australia, I believe, is in April. Um, April. Oh, yeah, we haven't announced it yet. That's right. Okay. There's a there's an East Coast uh, U.S. run coming up. Oh, okay, and that's in March. Okay, maybe we'll maybe we'll catch a show. Maybe we. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Uh, hit me up. Yeah. Um. Any any anything else you have coming up that that you know any anything of your own side projects or um uh there's no no touring i think this time for cute international um just ended up being too busy with other things to get a new band together or get a live version um ready to play anywhere um sun adams playing some shows we're, we're in the mixing process for our next record um that's going to be very, very cool. Right on. Yeah. And then I've just been, I've been doing music for a video game. Um, a bunch of it came out already and they asked me to do some more. So oh, that's I cool. live in this room until it's done. What kind of hobbies or interests do you have in your downtime? Um, I used to do a lot of uh, visual art stuff, um, but most of that just turned into like staring at a computer too. And so the last thing I want to do is open up a different program and move <laughs> the mouse around. <laughs> um, uh, but I don't know, hiking, I guess it would be something. Like just trying to get outdoors. Let's go. Are you more of an outdoors guy than a? No, I'm not. Not particularly. I just I always grew up. My parents always lived um, kind of outside of a, outside of the city um, in the woods. So, and that's what we would do on vacations: is go on like hiking trips and um, climb like climb mountains and stuff. Not not ropes and stuff but like hike to the top of mountains right are you ever worried about getting lost on your hikes or anything like that (laughs) i i i i I never go hiking i'm always worried i'm going to get lost or 
I'll be that guy. I know. I probably I should probably worry about that a bit more. I I don't. Um, man, going back to all those years back in Portland, um, before you guys started the Dandies, before any of this, did, is is there anything you wanted to be other than a musician? Did you I, have plans to do something else? Yeah, I, th- I thought I was going to go into like fine art of some sort. Um, I, you know, that's what I studied at school. Um, I did a bunch of like, uh, um, I guess stencils, spray paint and stencils is what I ended up doing at the end. And that's where I was developing a thing. Um, and I just thought it would, it would turn into something, but, um, and then the band just took off and barely you got were it. Gonna, you were going to do something creative. You, you know, oh, absolutely. You didn't want to be like a fireman or any of that shit. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was, it, I, I didn't think I had the chops to be a musician. So I was going to, I was trying to go the art, art, like, I don't know, painting route. Yeah. Um, and then, our version of punk happens grunge, you know, where everybody can play. Anybody can do it. And yeah. But yeah. Are you still into Duran Duran? Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I mean, when it comes down to it, it's like the, the first record was the one that really did it for me. Um, and I still think it's an amazing record. It sounds so cool. They really captured something like very, very unique. Yeah, it's really cool. Those songs, like they're 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 always going to be good. You know, years and years and years have passed by, and they're still good. Yeah, I hope I get to see them at some point. I, I've never I've never been in the right place at the right time. It's hard being a musician, a touring musician, or any anyone that tours, right? Because your favorite band comes to town and you're gone. You know, yeah. you're home and they're never to me. Sometimes you get lucky and whatever the band is is playing on your day off in whatever city that happens to be. <laughs> but that's yeah, that's pretty rare. Yeah. Well, Pete, man, we we really appreciate you doing this. Uh Thank you busy guy and we look forward hopefully we we're, we'll be around and we can catch you guys when you come to the east coast um we we'll definitely will keep keep an eye on that anything where can people find you um on social media um i'm on most of them I like facebook and instagram and twitter or whatever it's called now uh, uh yeah i i oh. It's it's a I don't like it. I don't like having to do it. I don't like that it's part of the job, but um, but I'm there. Right on, man. Well, our our podcast is called Is Breakfast Included? And if we were having breakfast now now, man, what would you have? Um waffles. Ah, okay. That's a rare one. <laughs> is it? Yeah. People rarely say waffles. It's that's a good one. I like waffles. It's a good one. It's a good one. Any coffee, juice, bacon, anything like that? No. Um, just berries, maybe blueberries. I don't know, man. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Pete, Thank thanks you so much. <laughs> you know, it was really appreciate it. Peter G. Holmstrom. What a cool down to earth guy. Bernie and I really enjoyed getting to know him, and I hope you all did too. Thank you to Peter for spending some time with us. We really, really enjoyed that. Okay, guys, don't forget to subscribe to our new YouTube channel that we just launched last week. You can listen to our entire catalog of episodes there. Also, make sure to visit our web store at isbreakfast.bigcartel.com to grab our latest merchandise, like our stylish new oxblood colored t-shirt. It would make a great gift for the holidays. Make sure you check that out. Your support means the world to us, so stay tuned for more exciting episodes. And remember that around here, breakfast is always included. <laughs>